Hi, it's me again, Rebecca Christofferson from LSU. Um, in part one, I talked to you about arbovirology and the multiple facets that go into transmission. And in part two, I'm going to talk to you about how the, we measure that and how we can take lab experiments and put it into a quantitative framework to sort of ask questions about how mosquito-borne viruses will spread in certain populations. So this framework that I'm talking about is vectoral capacity. It's a measure of the transmission potential of vector-borne diseases, especially barboviruses, and it is a function of viral, vector, and ecological properties. Vectoral capacity is influenced by any number of things, including viral genetics, vector genetics, co-infection, and even the microbiome or larval and adult habitats. Vectoral capacity is generally thought about as the number of subsequent bites that infect people given that we introduce a single infected mosquito into a naive population. In this way, it's somewhat analogous to the basic reproductive number, which is an epidemiological parameter that we use to describe the transmissibility of a pathogen, any pathogen, into a naive population. So vectorial capacity is um, here. This is the equation. And uh, M is the mosquito density, so that's the relative abundance of mosquitoes to people in a certain system. A is the daily man biting rate of the mosquito population. P is the probability of daily survival for the mosquito. And P is raised to the N, which represents the extrinsic incubation period. And P is the vector competence, which is the proportion of mosquitoes that are transmitting given exposure um, at a certain extrinsic incubation period. Now, in a previous talk, I introduced the concept of EIP50 to represent vector competence. Again, EIP is the extrinsic incubation period, and so EIP50 is the time it takes for 50% of the mosquitoes to become infectious given exposure. And we can directly put that into the vectoral capacity framework by setting B equal to 50% or 0.5 and changing out N for, e for the EIP50 that you then determine. How we uh, interpret v, uh, VC, which is vectoral capacity, is that when vectoral capacity is less than one, then we're considering this an inefficient system. And this is not likely to support sustained transmission. When vectoral capacity is greater than or equal to one, this is a system that has the potential to then spark an outbreak or to sustain transmission. Also in the previous talk, I showed you viral vector interactions. Um, and how the environment may uh, affect these. And that was to demonstrate that when we take into account not only transmission time, but the lifespan of the mosquito as well, then we sort of see how these differences in transmission fall out. So here again, we have a minimum time of transmission of 27 days at lower temperature. When we couple that with the mosquito lifespan of 32.4 days, days, we have a total maximum of 5.5 potential days of transmission. At a higher temperature, an optimal temperature of 28 degrees Celsius, we have a minimum time of transmission of 14 days, but we couple that with the average lifespan of 28.5 uh, days, and we have 14.5 days of maximum potential transmission. And so just these little changes in both the extrinsic incubation period um, and the mosquito life trains, this is how it falls out to affect what we think about as transmission potential. And so what we wanted to do was determine um, trans if we can use the vectoral capacity equation to sort of integrate all these mosquito life traits that are currently not really being considered in estimating transmissibility of an arbovirus. So how can we put all these into the framework? Well, we're going to use a system of Aedes aegypti and Zika to make the point. These are colony mosquitoes from my laboratory, which means they've been, in, they've been just propagated over time, many, many generations in captivity, and they're sort of been trained to be really good at biting and feeding. Um, and then Zika virus uh, we're using. So Zika virus, as you probably know, emerged in the Americas in 2015, 2016, and sparked a really, really big outbreak. And this is when we really attributed um, the microcephaly to Zika virus. And so Zika virus is a, is a public health um, 
important virus. But the reason that we chose this system in particular is that my colony mosquitoes are not particularly good or not particularly competent for Zika virus. And we wanted to take this inefficient system and determine whether or not when we take into account a whole lot of different mosquito life traits, does that perception of this system change? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Zika virus was first in, uh, identified in the mid-20th century in Uganda. And the early um, 21st century, there were several uh, outbreaks in the Pacific region. It emerged in the Americas uh, into a completely susceptible population in 2015. And so that's why it was sort of this explosive outbreak. It was just everybody was available for Zika to infect. And this is when we had, again, the newly associated clinical manifestations um, in this very large outbreak. And again, we're going to use Aedes aegypti and my colony mosquitoes. So the first thing we wanted to determine was when we look at the age structure of mosquitoes, does the timing of the infectious blood meal, whether they get it early or young or, young or old, affect the within mosquito kinetics of that virus? Is the infection dissemination and transmission rates different given a mosquito got the, the same virus at a young age versus got it as an older mosquito? And then we also have this kind of two blood meal um, control because there's some there's some evidence that multiple blood mills can change the competency of a vector population. And so what we wanted to see was the EIP50, as well as the infection dissemination rates, which is, does the mosquito get infected at all? And does that infection get out of the midgut? And then we also want to see, is there a difference in mortality? So the first uh, question was, does it affect mortality? So these are the three treatments. And this is, these are the mortality curves. The answer is not really. We saw some significant difference between the um, older one blood meal group and the older two blood meal group. But this was a difference of about mm, less than half a day. And so when we talk about statistical significance, we also have to talk about biological significance. And so in our opinion, that half a day really wasn't um, biologically relevant enough to take change the way we were thinking about this mortality. And so what we really did was determine that the average time to death was about 25 days. And so that translates to an average daily survival rate of 0.86. So if you remember P being part of our vectorial capacity equation, this is how we would usually represent it as 0.86, the average daily survival. We also wanted to look at whether or not the treatment would affect their biting habits. And they really, really didn't. Um, so we used a, a new kind of method to look at biting habits, um, not really looking at biting rate per se, but it was a good proxy for us to determine whether age was really just, are they willing to bite, are they willing to feed? And we found that no, the treatments don't have a lot of difference, but you can really see this really kind of age dependence here. So on the x-axis, I have age of the mosquitoes, and this is just whether or not they were willing to, to feed. The last thing we wanted to look at was the infection rate. So when a mosquito takes a blood meal, it infects her midgut, and that's when we have infection. After it infects the midgut, it either gets out of the midgut and disseminates to other tissue, that's a disseminated infection, and then after that, it may get to the salivary glands, at which point the mosquito will transmit. And so each of these things is a different step in the virus getting back out of the mosquito, and it all kind of describes the kinetics of the virus within the vector. So we didn't see any difference, as you can see, in the um, infection rates. This uh, x-axis, is important to note, is days post-exposure. So it doesn't matter what the mosquito age is, they all were at 5, 8, and 11 days post-exposure. And there's no difference in infection or dissemination. When we looked at the transmission rates and we looked at days post-exposure, we also didn't see um, much difference in their transmission rates uh, when you looked at it as a function of days post-exposure. However, we did notice that there was an age distribution. Uh, we found out that the EIP50 was approximately 18 days. And so we're going to then take all of this information and put it into our vectoral capacity equation the way that we usually do. So we have, we're going, to, we just set um, density equal to one, because again, that's a field measured um, parameter. We have a biting rate that we measured to be approximately average of 1.21 per day. And then we have our average um, probability of daily survival. And our EIP50, again, goes in for exchanging incubation. And then we're holding 
our vector competence at, at 50% to accommodate our EAP50. So when we look at that, we put it all together, then we get a vectorial capacity of 0.3. So yay, it's less than one. We're safe. This is wonderful. But are we though? We started thinking, if we look at it in an average way, yes, we are safe. But maybe that doesn't give us the whole picture. So again, if you notice this biting rate had a really pronounced age effect. As the mosquitoes get older, they just don't feel like doing anything. They just kind of want to hang around. They just look at you like, no, not today. And then if we look at the same um, transmission data, right, as a, as a function of age now and not as a function of days post-exposure, you see that the older mosquitoes didn't have a chance to live long enough to get to the point where they were contributing to the transmission cycle here with a 60% transmission rate. So how can we put that into a quantitative framework like vectorial capacity to sort of make this point of age structure and that it matters when determining viral system e efficiency? So graphically, let's, let's go over it. This is how we usually think of things. A mosquito gets a virus, there's some time in between, and then it transmits a virus. That's how we usually think about it. But what we're talking about in now is what if that mosquito got it later, right? She might be less likely to bite, or she might not live long enough to actually transmit. Or what if she got it earlier? Then she's got plenty of time to transmit, and she might actually be more likely to bite. Or what happens if she gets it early enough that she bites more than once after the extrinsic incubation period? Or what happens if she gets it older and she only bites with a probability of 45%? Because the probability of biting is not even in vectorial capacity at this point. And then, what if she gets it really early and she's just a voracious biter and she bites everybody all the time? These are things that we really cannot account for in the traditional vectorial capacity equation. So what we did was we took our data of um, predicted, uh, we took our data, which are the black dots, and we fit a distribution to them, which is the green lines, and we got predictions of um, daily probability of survival over time as a function of mosquito age now, not days post-infection. We did the same thing for the biting rate or willingness to bite. And then we also looked at the probability of biting because one of the things we noticed that not all the mosquitoes bit all the time. So there was a definite age distribution in whether or not a mosquito even felt like biting if she bit. So we have all of these things, predicted probabilities over every single possible age of the mosquito. How do we put that into the framework? So again, what do we usually do? We usually account for the mosquito gets the virus, there's some average time to transmission, and then the mosquito transmits the virus. We have some nebulous time over here that we assume doesn't matter, and then we have some nebulous time over here that doesn't matter, or we assume that doesn't matter. So what we really wanted to look at was changing these two nebulous times into this is some age at which the mosquito gets the infection. And then this is the leftover time after the infection that she has to transmit. And so we need to define those two tails of this life cycle to really understand what's going on with that virus. And the way that we did that was we took, we decoupled things like biting rate and probability of daily survival from the average to we let it breathe over the entire distribution of the age. So we have now, uh, if you recall, age was, uh, uh, biting rate, I'm sorry, was squared. That's because biting rate has to account for the bite where the mosquito gets the virus and the bite where she transmitted. So what we did is we decoupled those two bites and we said, well, the bite at which she gets the virus is going to be the biting rate at the age at which she gets the virus is going to be different than the biting rate at which she transmits the virus depending on the EIP and the age of the mosquito at both times. And we also added this parameter of Z, which is the probability of her biting. So given that she bites or not, what is the biting rate at her age of acquisition versus the biting rate at the age of transmission? And the age of transmission now is instead of um, being EIP, it's EIP plus this tail over here. So it becomes the age at which she acquires the virus plus the EIP. And now you have the age at which she transmits the virus. We also decoupled the um, mortality rate or the average survival rate of the mosquito from 
the EIP and made it a function of age. And the way that we did that was we just said, okay, we're going to take the daily probability of survival at each day. So instead of the average, we're going to say she can have a probability of really, really high at a young age and go all the way to really, really low depending on the age. And we're going to put that into this really fancy math equation that's going to tell us basically her cumulative probability of survival at the age of transmission, given whatever time she takes the virus. And what that shows us is that this inefficient system that we deemed probably wouldn't account for a lot of transmission is age dependent. If the mosquito takes a bite within the first seven days of life and gets the virus, this actually has a vectoral capacity of greater than one. And so what we've shown is that this inefficient system on average actually can contribute quite a lot to the transmission system in an age dependent manner. So aside from being really, really cool, what's the field relevance of this? Because so far it's really hard to tell the age of a mosquito in the field. But recent um, reports from Aedes albopictus and also from Anopheles mosquitoes is that people are trying to develop um, technology using infrared spectroscopy to do just that to age mosquitoes in the field. And so while this technology may not be on point and be able to tell us the exact age of a mosquito right now, they are working on it. This is something people want to do. And so when we have this technology and it's super ready to go, we now have a framework that we can take the age distribution of a mosquito, plug it into this VC age uh, distribution, and really get a good sense of what the, what the age structure transmission potential for this population is. So where else can we use this framework? Well, we're going to use it in everything just because that's what we do in lab. You make something and then you just you break it, just hammer it home. So we're going to use it to assess different viral phenotypes within mosquito population. So different viruses of the same species or the same type will have different phenotypes, which is often measured as vector competence, which we will measure as EIP50. So in that case, the EIP50 will really kind of go into judging the age of transmission, or determining the age of transmission. Uh, we will also use it to compare across mosquito populations, because if we use the same virus and we look at three different populations of mosquitoes, we might get three different transmission um, profiles. And then we can also use it to affect the role of environmental factors, such as temperature, which we've already talked about, on the vector virus system. Because temperature affects not only the viral kinetics within the mosquito, but many of these life traits, or not, if not all of them, that we've talked about and that we've now put into our vectorial capacity um, age-structured framework. So what have we learned? We learned that vectorial capacity is a good measure of transmission, but that we need to also account for these relevant pieces of the puzzle to be accounted for, like life traits of the mosquito, mortality rates, biting rates. These things all need to go into a framework for us to really make very nuanced comparisons. We also learned that if a mosquito takes a blood meal early enough, transmission systems that were usually deemed as inefficient may actually have some capacity to transmit, uh, to contribute to transmission in a significant way. But more importantly, this also, this also points to our need for a better understanding of all the temporal distributions of vector life traits, vector virus interactions, and the environmental impacts on all of these things. And there's a lot of labs around the country, including mine, looking at this, and I'm just excited to see where that literature goes in the next few years.